More on the 1855 Know Nothing Riots here in Louisville, Kentucky. The white Americans against the Irish, German, Catholics. All of them. Anti-German, anti-Irish, anti-Catholic. So... Bloody Monday riots claimed at least 22 at most, well, I guess at least 100. I think it killed at least 100 people, according to Bishop Martin Spalding. Uh, there may have been more victims, but an official inquiry was never conducted amidst the frenzy of finger-pointing that followed. The American Party swept the election statewide. Bloody Monday was a climactic and defining moment for no nothingism in Louisville. The nativist movement temporarily diverted attention from the seething slavery issue, but as a matter that cannot be ignored, and its presence was obvious within the party. After the Know Nothing Rights, 10,000 Germans left. 10,000 at least German Catholics and Irish immigrants left since that violence was allowed. They did not foresee them having any rights here in Louisville, so the immigrants left. Uh, the American Party remained a dominant political force in the city and state. By the summer of 1857, things began to change. The Kentucky American Party, although one of the strongest and best organized in the South, experienced a net loss of four offices in statewide elections that year. Louisville, where mobs of plug uglies had controlled the polls for several years, remained in American Party hands. So Louisville was controlled by the know-nothings, them using their gun-thug plug uglies in order to control the polls. Nationally, the American Party decline was underway. Its downward spiral nearly equaled its rapid rise. The slavery issue again took center stage and the know-nothing effort to make immigration the issue of the day failed. Working for a constitutional amendment to forbid Catholics and foreigners to hold public office, fighting to require a 21-year wait before an immigrant could vote, and forming the Joint Special Committee on the Inspections of Nunneries and Convents prove ghastly mistakes. <laughs> so, uh, the know-nothings, they couldn't, uh, they all hated the immigrants, but they couldn't figure out the slavery issue. Some were for, some were against. Uh, the know-nothings just knew that they hated the immigrants. Uh, that was one thing they all could agree on. The um, Constitution meant to forbid Catholics and foreigners to hold public office fighting. Uh, so no Catholics or foreigners, so then your religion, you, there's supposed to be church, uh, separation between church and state, but if you're a Catholic, you weren't allowed to have public office, which is why when JFK gained office as a Catholic, it made huge news since Catholics were, were like bad people. I remember my U.S. history teacher actually in Gallup County saying that. Not that we were bad people, but kind of saying, yeah, Catholics are a little different. They're a little, they're a little off. Because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of Baptists, and I guess the Protestants aren't just Baptists, but they're... Baptists, I think, are the biggest Protestants. Could be wrong on that. I don't, uh, I, I don't know about that. But okay. The slavery issue again took center stage in the Know Nothing effort to make immigration the issue of the day failed. Working for a constitutional amendment to forbid Catholics and foreigners to hold public office, fighting to require a 21-year wait before an immigrant could vote. So <laughs> if you're if you're an immigrant, you can come in, but you got to wait 21 years before you can vote. After 20, you've been running here for 21 years, then you're allowed to go ahead and pull that ballot box stick. Then they formed a spe joint special committee on the inspections of nunneries and convents. So they were studying the priests and the nuns and seeing what they were up to. And while you know it might seem odd that somebody would plead a life of celibacy and just work on issues of the church and social justice, it might sound crazy, but I think it also could be very liberating in the same sense. You have Buddhist monks. You got lots of people that do these things uh, voluntarily. If you uh, the issue is always there, you know, there's two ways you can go uh, get your last sacrament as a Catholic, and the one way is marriage. So you get married, have kids, or holy orders. You become a nun or a priest. So the option was always there, but it wasn't like they said you had to do. You know, you had to be a priest. So it wasn't a ton of pressure to to do something you didn't want to do. Um, so, I don't know, nuns, priests, um, you know, the, the pedophiles, they're, they're messed up. Well, that's, I agree. But I would say, generally speaking, nuns and priests are more humble folks than your average ruffian out here. I don't know. 
So, but they were they were huge mistakes. They they shouldn't have done that. That would prove to be their unfolding. The northern faction been, began embracing the new Republican Party, while the pro-slavery southern wing reluctantly leaned towards the Democratic Party. Its reputation as the, the party of choice among immigrants apparently forgotten. On state levels, no nothings were responsible for surprisingly enlightened legislation that gave women more rights and created the first desegregation de law in the state of Massachusetts. Louisville, the border city, was a study in contrast. It was a gateway town, pro-slavery and pro-union, with strong trade ties to both North and the South. So, um, there were also a great many slaves and free blacks, though their number in Louisville and Jefferson County were in decline. As the slavery debate heightened, in the 1860 election, Louisvillians resoundingly rejected Kentuckian Abraham Lincoln. So 1860s, the uh, Kentucky did not vote for their homegrown hero, Abraham Lincoln. And the 1860 election, Louisvillians resoundingly rejected Kentucky and Abraham Lincoln, the Republican candidate and John C. Breckinridge of the Southern Democrats. They gave a dignified second-place nod to regular Democrat Stephen A. Douglas, but it was John Bell of Tennessee under the banner of constitutional unionism, uh, made up of the old Southern, uh, the old old Southern old line Southern Whigs and former Know Nothings who sadly carried Louisville and Jefferson County. Nationwide, the death knell sounded for the Know Nothings. The party passed away in the maelstrom that saw foreign and native blood flow together on the fields of civil conflict. By 1861, the American Party had no representation in Congress and soon completely vanished from the political scene. So it almost seems like the know-nothing was a vacuum for the slavery issue instead of agreeing that uh, on the slavery issue, instead they were, uh, uh, they couldn't agree on the slavery issue, so instead they agreed to regulate the foreigners, the foreign immigrants. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the final say against no nothingism in Louisville came two weeks before the end of the Civil War on April 1st, 1865, which is nearly 10 years, less than 10 years after Bloody Monday. German Philip Tompert was elected mayor of Louisville. So it was the first German mayor in Louisville that was elected. Germans also were integral, uh, integral, important <laughs> for the kindergarten movement here in Louisville, too. I want to talk more about no nothing riots. So um, the uh, Reverend Carl Boswald of the Church of the Immaculate Conception at Eighth and Cedar rushed to the bedside of the dying parishioner, but fell fatally wounded by a hail of stones. James Speed, a local attorney and later Attorney General for Abraham Lincoln in 1864, witnessed the Bloody Monday riots. He worked in his office until about 5 p.m. And just before he left his office, he saw many blood-covered Irishmen carried off to jail. He witnessed a crowd yelling down Jefferson Street, guarding an Irishman to jail. Covered in blood between the front gate of the courthouse yard and 6th Street, the crowd took after a German who was going up Jefferson Street. The crowd struck him several times before he reached the courthouse gate. After he reached the yard, he was knocked down and beaten. To escape the blows, James Speed reported that the man crawled under the know-nothing stand. And from where James stood, he saw a man with an iron pitchfork stab the German man under the stand. So, they stabbed the German man underneath the stand. They dragged the German from under the stand, more dead than alive, and carried him to jail on their shoulders. James reported that he did not see any foreigner misbehave or do any ins insolent thing. So, yeah, when, in this report, uh, later on at the top when they said that Germans were starting it and just shooting in the carriages and stuff. I don't know if I believe that. It just sounds like some made-up bullshit. They're just shooting in the carriages just because. Nah, it sounds more likely that the know-nothings were walking around, uh, the white Americans were walking around looking for an issue to start fighting and using violence against them. There was an angry mob, and they were angry, and they hated the foreigners. Probably also a lot of the people in the mob probably also hated black folks. Probably just was just a ball of hatred. A big mob of hate. So James reported that he did not see any foreigner misbehavior do any insolent thing. That's James Speed, who was the, the mayor, the Catholic mayor at the time. The know-nothings overwhelmingly won the elections, and James Moorhead became Kentucky's know-nothing governor. 
So no, no nothing's won a ton of things. Governorship, congressional seats, and um, and uh, uh, several uh, city council positions in the mayor and the mayorship. Right. Eventually, they're able to push uh, Speed at uh, James Speed out. Humphrey Marshall became a U.S. senator, but like the Whig Party, they split over the sectional issue of slavery and they lost their power. By June 1857, the Know Nothings disbanded in Kentucky. The riots tarnished the reputation of George Prentice, since George Prentice was the one fanning the flames like a fucking fucking dickhead. It's just Colonel Courier Journal. He was the it was the the Daily Journal, Louisville Daily Journal, which eventually became the Courier Journal. So this is a predecessor to the Courier Journal, George Prentice, anti-German um, newspaper. Many editorials and other periods accused Prentice of instigating the riots. His statue outside the Louisville public um, public library has a plaque describing his tarnished legacy. Wow, his statue outside the Louisville public library has a plaque describing his tarnished legacy. So George Prentice. I think I got a picture of that actually. Right outside the library, there's a there's a uh, him that's sitting down on a chair, but I guess there's a plaque that describes how his legacy was tarnished because of the 1855 riots, the Bloody Monday riots in Louisville. Luckily, Louisville's racist past has not lingered into the 21st century. <laughs> the city hosts many immigrants from many different countries and celebrates a diversity with World Fest on the Belvedere every year and the Americana Fest. Louisville takes pride in a variety of restaurants, including the Irish, German, Italian, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Japanese. One of the important lessons taught by 1855 riots was that never let passion, fear, or hatred to control Americans' decision-making. So it's not exactly true. There's a lot of uh, 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 racists and white supremacists in um, Kentucky and Louisville here today. I'm surprised, actually, being Louisville being the chocolate city of Kentucky. I would say the rest of Kentuckians kind of look at Louisville as the big metropolis in Kentucky. And when they think of the big metropolis, they probably think also that there's a black community here. And since there are 99% white in, you know, the rest of Kentucky, actually there's a 4% African-American rate in the rest of Kentucky. Whereas here in Louisville, it's like 20%. So that, uh, and their image, the popular image, is a chocolate city. So there's, you know, a lot of black folks there and there's not black folks from where they're coming from. So being the chocolate city, of Louisville, I'm shocked and surprised um, that there would be that many white racists, white supremacists here, anti-immigrant, you know, pricks, bunch of piece of shit, racist dickheads. It's one thing to see culture and see the difference, differences between culture, but to hate an entire group of people, you know, I don't trust anybody, but I don't, I don't hate an entire group of people. So, um, no nothings off of uh, just a general abstract from Wikipedia it was a movement by the nativist American political faction in the 1850s characterized by political xenophobia, anti-Catholic sentiment, sentiment, and occasional bouts of violence against the groups. The nativists targeted the white Americans. It is empowered by popular fears that the country is becoming overwhelmed by German and Irish Catholic immigrants who are often regarded as hostile to Republican values and controlled by the Pope in Rome. Rome. Mainly active from 1854 to 1856, it strove to curb immigration and naturalization. Through its efforts, met with little success. Membership was limited to Protestant males of British American lineage. So if you're British, you're Protestant, you're considered a true blue white American. If you're a British, Protestant. But if you were not a British Protestant, if you're a German Catholic, an Irish Catholic, you are considered a foreigner, and you need to get it the hell out of the Protestant English men's country. The Protestant Englishmen thought they owned this country. So, um, there's few prominent leaders. The largely middle class, entirely Protestant membership fragmented over the issue of slavery. Nativists had become active in politics in New York in 1843 as the American Republican Party spread to nearby states as the Native American Party, which appealed to native-born white citizens, and won a few thousand votes in 1844. Historian Tyler Ann Bender warns, however, that the Native American Party should not be confused with the Know-Nothings because the two different groups ran separate tickets in the same elections in the 1850s. So that's interesting. The, uh, they're saying that the Native American Party and the Know-Nothings shouldn't be confused since they had... Uh, similar platforms, but different memberships and different political parties. 
So that's a short synopsis. And kindergarten's coming up a little bit more about the 1855 riots coming up, but the kindergarten movement here in Louisville and how the Germans pushed kindergarten uh, for for Louisvillians to to learn. So.